The Ronald L. Dart Evangelistic Association is pleased to present Wes White with Turn the Page, featuring Ron Dart. Church government. How should the leaders of a church be selected? And once in office, how much authority should those leaders have? One of the most utilized forms of church government is hierarchical, that is, church government from the top down. Hierarchical church government is probably the most efficient form of ecclesiastical management, but does that make it the preferred method, the right method? Ronald Dart shows how the Bible, in no uncertain terms, teaches against hierarchical church government. And he does this by addressing the following issues. The Jethro hierarchy that we find in Exodus 18. The selection of deacons in the early chapters of Acts. The concept of offices as mentioned in Ephesians 4. The 70 elders mentioned in Numbers 11. The gifts of God as mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12. The position of Moses within ancient Israel. The contention that God works primarily through only one man at a time. The distribution of civil and religious authority in the nations of Israel and Judah during the times of the kings. The way that Gentiles practiced authority over others. And the two major statements made by Jesus regarding church government. Are you ready to expand your thinking? Then stay tuned as we turn the page back to 1995 and a sermon by Ronald L. Dart entitled, Moses to Jesus. Once upon a time, there was a people who believed that they had the truth. They believed this firmly, more than you can imagine. And they didn't come to it lightly either. They came to it as a result of study over a period of years, sometimes through 20 and 30 lessons of a correspondence course. Hours of Bible study, many questions, many discussions, hours of, of wrangling sometimes and working their way through questions and scriptures and so forth. They came to their beliefs with some difficulty, but with some, with a great deal of firmness. In the process of implementing these beliefs, which they called the truth, in their lives, they made sacrifices that would make you weep. People oftentimes with long careers who walked away from them because of Sabbath problems. People who lost retirement programs because of the Sabbath problem of the keeping of the holy days. Uh, people who had families separate. Men who had wives leave them or wives who had husbands leave them or throw them out. Of children who had to then go back and forth visiting between families because one person or another could not accept what the other person had come to see as the truth. There was a great deal of conviction, belief. And I firmly believe that many of these people would have given their lives for the truth. They believe it that strong. Certainly, in the process of coming to baptism and of counseling for baptism, they were encouraged to count the cost and were warned that this truth could someday cost them their lives, and they accepted it a lot with still, with firmness, with faith, and with a deep and a profound conviction. What is shocking to me to realize is that many of these same people over a matter of weeks, perhaps months at the outside, very few months at that, but really over a matter of weeks, simply turned around and went the other way and concluded that all those things that they had proved with such difficulty, that they had put into their lives with such sacrifice, were not the truth, but were wrong. And they did it just like that. I would never have believed it was possible. Because the fact is that the people who accepted these things and proved these things did not accept them because of the authority of the teacher. Because, you see, the authority of the teacher could only be established by a higher authority, right? You come to this teacher from nowhere. He has no credentials for you. He has, there is no reason why you should believe him above any other teacher, for the world is full of teachers and preachers. And so they did not accept these things because of his authority. They had to prove that right along with all kinds of other things that they had to prove. They had to go to a source. They went to the Bible, a higher authority, to establish all the things that they believed. And when I think of all they had to do to come to that belief and how little it took for them to cast it aside 
I have to ask myself, how was this possible? What made this easy, quick change possible? In the simplest possible terms, it was possible because of a wrong idea of church government. Now, church government is a funny concept when you really just think about it for a while, because I don't really recall you reading through the Bible and finding the word church government anywhere to be found in the whole thing. Not that way, at least. And the idea of church government, though, has become, became to those people, and is perhaps still in the minds of many people who will hear my voice, very important, an extremely important thing in the understanding of how the church works, or is supposed to work, or to govern itself, or to be governed. Now, as important as it is, one would think that church government would be clearly laid out in your New Testament. It is not. If it were, I could just simply take you and say, let's, let's turn to Paul's instructions on how the New Testament church is to be governed. Or let's turn to Jesus' statement, instructions to his apostles as, how, as to how to organize, structure, and set up the New Testament church. But there is no place in the Bible where that is to be found. Jesus actually had very little to say on the church the subject of church government, and what he did have to say is cautionary. If you'll turn back to Matthew 20, I want to give you the first great principle of church government that Jesus Christ handed down to his disciples. Now, they came at all this with a set of expectations. They anticipated that the Messiah would be a physical ruler, that he would put down the Roman rule, that he would organize armies and overthrow the Romans and establish the kingdom of Israel once again, and that he would rule over that kingdom of Israel as the son of David. And, and they assumed from this a kingship, that is, a physical rulership, a regal authority that would exist with a throne in Jerusalem. And therefore, they expected the same kind of an authority structure that they might have seen in ancient Israel under Saul or David or one of their descendants who ruled on a physical throne over physical Israel. They look for a kingly type of authority structure. And so someone comes along and says, uh, Lord, grant that my sons will be allowed to sit one on your right hand and one on your left hand in your kingdom. And Jesus said, you don't understand what you're asking for. Not only did she not understand what she was asking for, she had a completely false expectation of what the kingdom was going to be when it was going to be. But the problem is, many people assume that this kingly type of government was something that Jesus intended to establish in the church. They looked for a kingdom of God superimposed over the church. Now, here's what Jesus had to say when his disciples began to get in a little bit of an uproar over the question and request that this woman had made. In Matthew 20 and verse 25, he called everybody together and said, Hold on, fellows. You know that the princes of the, of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority over them. Now, he said, this is a simple thing. You're all familiar with this structure of governance, where these princes will exercise dominion over, and they that are great will exercise authority over. It starts all the way up to the king, and the people who are under the king are ruled by the king, and the people who are ruled by the king rule the people under them in a vertically structured hierarchy. But it shall not be so among you, Jesus said. He explicitly, right from the very beginning, forbids his disciples in the church to establish a vertically structured authority or dominance in the church. He said, don't do it. Now, that was one thing that we had real clear. Mr. Armstrong made it clear to all of us right at the very beginning of the Feast of Tabernacles, of the first Feast of Tabernacles, of the CGI, in Jekyll Island in 1978. But that was not clear. That, began, you know, that, that particular thing leaked out into our face very early on, and he set the pace on that right from the beginning. You saw clearly it's not supposed to be that way among us, and, said, and made it very clear to all of us ministers and laymen alike that it wasn't going to be that way. Jesus said, It shall not be so among you. Whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life for many. Now, it's pretty simple, isn't it? What Jesus said to his disciples was that the vertical power system that they kind of envisioned in their mind, their expectations that they had built up, was essentially a Gentile system 
and he wanted no trust with it in his church. That in fact, even the royal system of the Old Testament, as it was established under Saul and his successors, was not what God wanted. Do you remember that? That God had no intention of having a king over Israel, for he was their king. It was not his desire to have a human being under him over the people, not from the very beginning, was it? If I read my Bible right, I'm going to tell you how it's going to work. They're going to oppress you. They'll take your sons and your daughters and they'll put them in their palace cooking pastries for the king. They'll take your land. They'll take your crops. Sounds like the Internal Revenue Service. But his point was, you're the ones that wanted this. I'm not the one that wanted this. And so now we come down to the time where Jesus has his disciples getting a little bit, well, revealing their expectations about how things should be. And he tells them, your expectations are not mine. It's my expectation that you will not have this vertical hierarchy among you of one person exercising dominion over another, another person exercising authority over another person. I don't want it that way. So here we have the first principle of church government laid out by Jesus Christ, so anybody really ought to be able to understand it. But I heard someone recently make the statement that the hierarchical style, or the pyramid style too, of church government is biblical and God-ordained. I will tell you, it is biblical, but it is not God-ordained. Now, that may sound like double talk to you, but if you'll turn back to Exodus, I'll show you precisely what I mean. Exodus, the 18th chapter. Something can be biblical, that is, in the Bible, and not be ordained by God. In, in, in Exodus, the 18th chapter, and we begin reading in verse 13. It came to pass on the morrow that Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood by Moses from the morning until the evening. Uh, what's going on is really very simple. Uh, whenever you have this many people together in one place, you're going to have conflicts galore rising up. You're going to have question on top of question regarding law, regarding custom, regarding practice, regarding uh, conflict and rights that will come up all day long. So they queued up. You had a line that ran from Moses up and around the first butte to the right and down through this valley until finally, you know, he would sit there all day long passing judgment on one case after another. Now, when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did to the people, he said, what are you doing? Why are you sitting by yourself alone? And all the people stand by you from morning to even. And Moses said, Well, they come to me to inquire of God. When they, when they have a matter, they come to me. I judge between one another, and I make them to know the statutes of God and his law. Don't you notice anything peculiar about that? We haven't gotten to Sinai yet. The Ten Commandments have not been given yet. All that stuff that Moses wrote down in the book of the law had not even been, been handed down to him yet. And yet he knew God's statutes and his laws already. But that's another subject. Moses' father-in-law said to him, the thing you're doing is not good. Now you're going to surely wear away, you and this people that are with you. This thing is too heavy for you. You are just not able to perform it yourself alone. Now listen to me. I will give you counsel. God will be with you. You be for the people toward God that you may bring their causes to God, and you shall teach them ordinances and laws and show them the way wherein they must walk and the work that they must do. Moreover, you shall provide out of all the people able men such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place them over them to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, rulers of tens, and let them judge the people at all seasons. Moses said, that's a good idea. And he did it. So up that way, they chose out the people, set up their judiciary, and they began to work with the people along these lines. And people got to bed earlier. Moses didn't get worn out quite so bad. It actually worked pretty good. Now, when we consider what, what we've got here, where do you find in this chapter that God appeared to Moses and said, you shall instruct your captains of thousands, captains of hundreds, captains of ten, and so forth through the people and you'll set up this judge in this way. Is it in here? No. Who made the suggestion to Moses? His father-in-law. Midianite, I believe. Not God. Who decided to do it? God? No. Moses decided to do it. And so the first hierarchical structure of government was the idea of Moses' father-in-law. It was a solution to a problem. It was a human solution to a problem, a solution which God might well have been prepared to work with, God might have been prepared to allow to happen, might not have had any big exception to it, but let's not get confused. 
It's biblical, but it is not God-ordained. Now, what do you suppose God would have said if Moses went to God and said, Boy, listen, this thing is really going to be too big a burden for me. I can't stay on top of it. How should I handle the situation that I find myself up against? What do you think God would have said? Well, as it happens, we, can, we happen to know what God would have said because the situation did arise. Numbers 11. If you'll just turn back to Numbers 11. And I'll begin reading in verse 11. And Moses said to the Lord, Why have you afflicted your servant, and why have I not found favor in your sight, that you lay the burden of all this people on me? And boy, I can understand what he's talking about. It doesn't even take that size of group of people to become a terrible, terrible burden. Then the small congregations can really get to be a burden from time to time. So he's really tired. And he says, What have I done to you that you've done this to me? Have I conceived this people? Have I begotten them that you should say to me, carry them in your bosom like a nursing father bears a, bears a sucking child into the land that you swore to their fathers? Now, but, you know, this is tough talk coming from a man to God. This is a man supposed to be meek. And I will tell you, I, I don't know that I, if I knew I was talking to God and God's here and, I, and I'm aware of him, I don't know if I could talk to God like this. But I will tell you, when you are in extremis, when you're up against it, and when you're right out at the end of the rope, you tie a knot in the rope, and you're hanging on to it, and the knot's becoming frazzled, uh, that's the Moses that we've got right here talking to God. And he says, where am I supposed to get flesh to give to these people? They're crying and saying, give us flesh to eat. I can't bear all these people alone. It is too heavy for me. If you're going to deal this way with me, kill me. I mean, what else are you going to do to me? Kill me. Just get it over with. Kill me out of hand if I have found favor in your sight, and don't let me have to see my record." Well, you know, God could have done just that, but he decided not to. He said, instead, Gather unto me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people, and officers over them, and bring them to the tabernacle of the congregation, that they may stand there with you. I will come down and talk with you there. And I will take of the Spirit that is upon you, and I will put it upon them, and they shall bear with you the burden of the people, so that you don't have to bear it by yourself alone. You say to the people, Set yourselves apart against tomorrow. You'll have flesh to eat. He tells them they're going to be eating flesh till it runs out of their nostrils. He's so, you know, going to really make a point with these people over this. He says in verse 23, uh, Is the Lord's hand waxed short? You'll see now whether my words shall come to pass to you or not. So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord and gathered 70 men of the elders of the people, and he set them around about the tabernacle. Now notice, these were men who Moses knew to already be captains of the people already leaders among them, already elders, known to the people, respected by the people. And it was Moses who was allowed to pick these individuals. God says, you pick them, you bring them up here, and I'll put my spirit upon on them. Moses did it. He had them up there. And the Lord came down in a cloud and spoke to him and took of the spirit that was upon him and gave it to the seventy elders. And it came to pass that when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied and did not cease. They just couldn't stop once it came upon them. The power of God descended upon these men. But there remained two of the men in the camp. The name of the one was Eldad, the name of the other was Medad, and the Spirit rested upon them, and they were of those that were written but didn't go to the tabernacle. They prophesied out in the camp. And the young man ran and told Moses and said, Eldad and Medad do prophesy in the camp. And Joshua, oddly, just like the disciples of Jesus, said, My Lord Moses, forbid them. Stop them. And Moses said, Do you envy for my sake? I wish all of God's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put his Spirit upon all of them. And this is the kind of man you want in charge. The man says, You're envying for my sake that somebody out here is doing God's work. I wish everybody had the Holy Spirit. Get off my back. This is a highly significant event in so many ways, I don't even, I don't even think to tell you all of them. But take, for example, an assumption that Joshua had and that many other people would have is that you can't function outside of the assembly. Here were two individuals who were over here doing something somewhere else. Whatever their reasons were aren't mentioned. I presume the reasons don't matter. But they were on the list that Moses had all written down. These are the 70 guys. And wherever they were, the Spirit of God came upon them, and they began to prophesy where they were. They did not have to be right there in this little group of 70 that they had gathered around the tabernacle under Moses' thumb. And that was Joshua's concern. He was afraid all this stuff might get out of control. 
Now, I want you to think about these two solutions for a moment because they are very, very different. There's a thing in modern uh, uh, thought having to do with the structure of organizations and, and how companies work and how administration takes place called the span of control. And the idea is that every man has what is called a span of control. That is, he can have, let's say, five people reporting to him. But if he has a sixth person, his effectiveness begins to break down. A seventh when it breaks down still further. Eighth when it breaks down still further. So that the fact is that things start getting out of control if, if a man's uh, reach, I mean, he extends his grasp and he can't really keep track of all the people he's got, things theoretically begin to come unglued. So that the, in theory, the pyramid-style structure that, that Moses constructed at Jeremiah, I'm sorry, at, at his father-in-law's suggestion, Jethro, should have worked better than the other one did. But there was one very large difference between the two of them, wasn't there? In the second one, the individuals were empowered with God's Spirit, presumably had access to God, could work under God's direction without Moses telling them what to do. They were empowered individually to do the work. Now, there's a funny thing about hierarchical structures, about pyramid-style structures. And if you ever, when you get home tonight and you've got a little time, sit down and draw one of these things out on paper, if you will, and see what you find when you get it drawn out. Inevitably, when you put this type of thing together, you come out with this pyramid shape with one person at the top, and when you begin to realize what these things do and how they actually work, you will see that the effect of this structure is to focus power more and more in a narrow line until finally all that power comes into focus on one man who wields the entirety of the power for the whole thing. Then go and diagram the other one that God gave, adding to it the fact that the empowerment upon each of the 70 people came directly from God and did not come through Moses. Moses did not even have to be present when that power was passed on. It's reminiscent of the Apostle Paul, who was on the road to Damascus to persecute the church in Damascus, when he was stricken down by God and, and, and converted, and his life changed and turned around and commissioned to do a work for God, and it was done without any help from Peter and James or any of those guys down in Jerusalem. It was done by Jesus himself, personally and directly. The difference between these two things is, is really pretty fascinating, and it has to do with the distribution of power. It seems, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, that God is not interested in focusing all that power in on one person because God knows how much damage one person can do if you give him all that much power. Rather, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, he diffused that power among his people and empowered his people directly so that that type of thing might not happen. Now, years ago, there got to be a kind of a false concept of church government in which it was seen that Moses was a kind of a type or a model for the Old Testament of the physical or human head of the church in the New Testament. In other words, the Old Testament Israel was the Old Testament church, and then you have the New Testament church. Well, you had a human head over the Old Testament church in Moses. You had a human head of the church in the New Testament who is over the church. And as a consequence of this, out of the many Old Testament examples, where the children of Israel, one or many of them, challenged Moses, it was suggested that to challenge the human leader of the church was on a par with challenging Moses, in which case the ground opened up and swallowed people up whole and they fell down to their deaths, or people were smitten with leprosy and turned white all over them and screaming out in the night, uh, you know, that, that God would pronounce all these terrible plagues upon anyone who would in any way resist this person who was the physical head of the church. Actually, the idea that Moses is a type of the human leader of the church is wrong, completely and utterly wrong. If you'll turn back to Acts, the third chapter, I will show you that this is true. Acts chapter 3, and I'll begin reading in verse 19. Peter is preaching and says, Repent, therefore, and be converted, change, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing come from the presence of the Lord. He shall send Jesus Christ, who was before preached to you, whom the heavens must receive until the times of the restitution of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. 
For Moses truly said to the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me, him shall you hear in all things whosoever, whatsoever he shall say to you. It shall come to pass, every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Who is that prophet? It's very plain, isn't it, in the context of Acts, that that prophet is Jesus. It's not some human being who's the president of a corporation or at the head of a pyramid or a hierarchical or a church government on the face of the earth whom people refer to as the human leader of the church. Let me give you a principle here. To attempt the role of Moses in the church. Are you with me? You might even want to write this one down so you don't forget it. To attempt the role of Moses in the church is to usurp the authority of Christ. It's to put yourself in the place of Christ. Jesus Christ is the only head of the church. God gave him to be the head of the church in all things. The truth is that we have understood that from the beginning of Jesus Christ was the only head of the church. So, the first principle of New Testament church government is this. Jesus retained the real power to himself and diffused power among the men, the truth is that we have understood that from the, from the beginning of the Church of God International, Jesus Christ was the only head of the church. So, the first principle of New Testament church government is this. Jesus retained the real power to himself and diffused power among the men. And indeed, there were men who led the church. But that power was diffused among them because Jesus knew how much harm damage, havoc, and confusion we human beings could reap if we had too much power and got too, you know, so much authority and could misuse and abuse that authority and misuse and abuse God's people. By the time any part of the New Testament was written, what there was of church government was already there. It was in place. I don't know, many people don't seem to, you know, it's hard to keep your mind, just to focus on this. But the first books of the New Testament were not written until after 50 A.D. The church had been down here percolating along for 20 years, longer than we've been, you know, since, since, since that 1978 Feast of Tabernacles. They had been actually functioning as an institution a lot longer than we had before the first words of the New Testament were ever put down on a piece of papyrus, parchment, or whatever they were originally written on. So what there was of church government was actually there, it was percolating, it was moving along, and, and, and it was really taken for granted. And as a consequence, when the men sat down to write about the New Testament church, they didn't care to say much about it. They had more important things to talk about. Church government by this time was pretty well taken for granted. And you and I are left to gather what we know about it from fragments and from inferences. One of the first things we learn is that ministerial offices evolved over time. How do I know that? Well, that's simple. In the beginning, there were apostles. That's all. The entire structure of the New Testament church government was 12 guys who were apostles, and who, as far as we can tell, shared that authority equally among them. Someone said, well, uh, did Jesus say somewhere who he left in charge? Or if he didn't say so, why do you think he didn't? And the answer is because he intended to stay in charge himself. That should be an easy one to understand. So why do you leave anybody in charge if you're not going away? Because he said, lo, I am with you until the end of the age, right? So he's not going away. He didn't leave somebody in charge. He intended to stay in charge of the church. So in the beginning, there were apostles. <clears throat> and as time went by, guess what happened? Church grows like a weed, baptized 3,000 people in one day. More than hundreds are baptized day by day, and a 1,000 here and a 1,000 there. And the church gets in, in and around Jerusalem, which is all there is of the church, gets rather big. And because there are all these people here with problems and difficulties and things they have to work with and work their way through, over time, they can't, they, 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 they just can't sort, sort all the problems out. They have to deal with them some way. So what they did was, in the process of time, there were people who were picking up jobs. There were widows who did not have enough to eat. So, hey, what are we going to do about this? So people got together and they organized a little thing to do it. There was another organization got together over here to organize a way to take care of this problem. And so it was that as time went by, a, an organization of service began to grow up like topsy among the church. 
And as any type of organizational structure that grows up that way is, it tended to be confusing and confused, and certain gaps were there, and there was a murmuring that began to arose among the people because the widows were neglected in the daily administration. So the apostles gathered everybody together and they said, look, it does not make sense for us to leave the word of God and wait on table. So I'll tell you what you do. I want you people to look you out among you, seven men of honest authority, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may set over this business. Now, how do you suppose people did that? The apostles didn't do it. They told the people to do it. So the people went away and they sat and they looked at one another and they talked a while and they chatted for a while and names were mentioned and names may have been written down and they talked and by some means, by head nodding or winking or shuffling of the feet or, or grunts or groans or expressions of disapproval on their face, they made their will known until finally, by some means, made their will known. Uh, just among friends, let me tell you what that is that's voting. Uh, they kind of, by some means or other, voted and put seven guys forward for them to appoint over this business. What's interesting about this is that they had no revelation from Jesus that said, you shall appoint deacons over the church. They had no instructions from the Holy Spirit. There were no visions that were handed down to any of them. They cited no scriptures. What did they appeal to? Reason. Exactly the same thing that Jethro appealed to when he came to Moses and said, you know, what you're doing isn't reasonable. You need to find a more reasonable approach to trying to take care of this task and to get this job done. And so, they then create the first division of labor in the church. And the division of labor they created was a division between the ministry of the Word and the ministry of the service of the people. We'll give ourselves to the ministry of the Word, they said. You guys take care of the ministry of the people. And so off they went. So the first thing we learn about structure and New Testament church government is that that government evolved over time in response to the problems that existed in the church. Now, there were some decisions, though, having to do with leadership in the church that the people could not make. The people could decide, you know, this guy's a good guy, he'd make a good deacon. They, they could decide all kinds of things about waiting on tables and doing that sort of thing. But there were some decisions that they could not make. If you'll turn back to 1 Corinthians 12, I want to show you a very fascinating and some, I think, often misunderstood concept about church government from, from this 1 Corinthians 12. This is not, by the way, the chapter that is the church government chapter. It's the spiritual gift chapter. Now, if you'll just take a look down, down the way here. He talks about all the diversities of gifts, all the administrations, the, the, the operations, the words of wisdom, and the things that God pours out upon the church. I won't read it all to you. I want you to come down to verse 28 of 1 Corinthians 12. And God has set some in the church. First, apostles. Secondarily, prophets. Thirdly, teachers. After that, miracles. Then, gifts of healing, help, government, diversities of tongues. Is everybody an apostle? Of course not. Everybody a prophet? No way. Is everybody a teacher? Uh-uh. Does everybody work miracles? No. Do all have the gift of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? No. He then tells them, covered earnestly the best gifts. And of course, according to him, the best gift of all was the one in the chapter following, which is love. And I don't know how we never got around to it, but there is no office called love in the ministry of the church. And yet it is the greatest gift of any of the gifts that are hereby mentioned. Now, this is often taken to say, you know, because it says first and second and so on, but this now creates a hierarchy of offices in the church of people who are above, some people above another. Before I comment on that, turn back to Ephesians, the fourth chapter, where something similar is said. In Ephesians, the fourth chapter, it talks about these things. It says, verse 11, He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, I want to point out something to you that ought to be obvious, but which is kind of, kind of missed from time to time. Whatever offices there are here in these two chapters, are, uh, they were created and grew out of the distribution of spiritual gifts. Think about it. God has set some in the church. 
It isn't that the apostles have set them there, or the apostle singular has set them there. It doesn't say the ministry has set them there. It says God set them there. In hierarchy, it's men who set them there. But right in the middle of this, both, both examples of this, almost this, the second item in there poses this huge problem. Now, I can remember in years gone back where we would make, have meetings and we would discuss who might become an evangelist or we might discuss who's going to be elevated to pastor rank and who's going to be elevated to preaching elder from a local church elder rank. And all these ranks were all laid out of the ministry as we sat there and discussed all this. But I don't remember, and I know Mr. Armstrong doesn't, won't either, any time when we ever sat there and discussed who would be the next prophet. Now, why didn't we do that? Well, being a prophet depends on God giving you a prophecy, doesn't it? Don't you have to have a message handed down from God? Isn't there some inspiration, some, some gift, some, something of that nature that has to be handed down from on high for you to have that kind of an office, or, or if it's an office at all? But look at it more as a function, and you understand this is a gift of God. We can't decide those things. Now, I want to tell you what 1 Corinthians 12 and Ephesians 4 do not describe. They do not describe a vertical hierarchy with apostles who are over all evangelists, who are over all pastors, who are then in turn over preaching elders, who are over local church elders, who are over deacons, all of them, and then, and then all these people are over all the brethren. You don't even find most of that stuff in there if you think about it. Where are the elders? Where are the deacons? Well, the fact of the matter is, we're not talking about those officers. We're talking about spiritual gifts. It's a different concept altogether. And if you will remember, all we did is we had the brethren look out among them for seven men, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, men of honest support, whom we may set over this business. Why would they be listed in the list, list of spiritual gifts when we're not having the Holy Spirit come down upon a person and then move them to prophesy and say, oh my, this person's a prophet. Indeed, one wonders why we would ever need to ordain a prophet. Once he starts prophesying, isn't that enough? What you're talking about in these chapters is not a hierarchy of church offices. If it's a hierarchy of any kind, it's a hierarchy of importance of church gifts and how they affect the church. And even that hierarchy in that part, I think, may be rather suspect. But now I want to take you to Jesus' second other great statement, really about the only other serious one he made about church government. It's found right at the end of the, book of, of the book of Matthew. You may not think of this as a, a statement on church government, but it is very much one. Matthew 28, if I can ever get there. Matthew 28 and verse 19. Go you, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. That's where we usually start. Let's don't start there. Let's start with verse 18. Jesus came and said to them, saying, All power is given to me in heaven and in earth. Where is the focus of power in the church? Jesus. Who is the head in all things to the church? Jesus. All power is given to me. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Notice that last one? The two statements. All power is given to me, and I am with you always. I am not going away. The Pope is called the Vicar of Christ. The Vicar is uh, defined as, as the person... Uh, who will be in charge when the ruler is gone, as it were. The Pope was placed as the vicar of Christ to be in charge of the church when he, that is Christ, should be gone. But you see, Jesus made it clear that he needed no vicar because he did not intend to be gone. He intended a hands-on, direct rulership of his church and directing of, directing of his church. Now, the idea that God works through this preacher or that apostle or this church leader should be viewed with great suspicion. I've heard a lot of that. Well, God worked through Mr. Armstrong, and now he's working through so-and-so, and, 
And God works through this person, and God works through that person. I want you to understand something. God can work through a jackass. He did. He worked through a jackass. He spoke to Balaam through his donkey. And I suppose if God can work through a jackass, he can work through me. If we understand it that far, it's okay to talk about God working through a man. But when that is construed as that person being an exclusive channel of God's grace, an exclusive channel of access to God, an exclusive channel of the knowledge and the doctrines of God, we have a new vicar of Christ in that person. And it is idolatry. Purely and simple. When you place someone in the place of Christ while he's going to be gone, you have put an idol in the place of Christ. Church government actually is not a major concern in the New Testament. Interesting thought, isn't it? Church government is just not a major concern. What is important in the New Testament is the sovereignty of Jesus Christ in each of us. Jesus Christ is your Lord. The ministry is your servant. Turn the Page is a production of the Ronald L. Dart Evangelistic Association. To contact us or for more information, please visit our website, rlda.com.